So thanks very much, Sharon. That was a, a brilliant um, presentation. And I really like the way you joined the dots um, between all the various themes. Um, I'm new to a lot of the, um, the folk working in the uh, Antarctic community. So I wanted to, um, I guess, give quite a general presentation um, to start off with, but and also um, make reference to some of the um, areas within SAFE outside of the scientific realm where, um, where I'll also be contributing. So it requires me to, I guess, provide a little bit more about who I am um, in this presentation, um, just so you can understand a bit about my background, um, because as I said, I'm, I'm new to, to many of you. So uh, just now, this is where my multiple screen issues are going to come into play when I try to move things on. So um, I'm an environmental scientist and um, I so come from mostly a biology background, but in, the, in my own research program, I've been um, strongly interdisciplinary. And um, that's also led me to work both within uh, the university sector. So I'm currently at QUT, I had adjunct roles at UQ and University of Copenhagen. But I've also taken time out of academia um, to work for the Nature Conservancy. And I was part of the team that set up the Nature Conservancy in Australia several years ago. I've also been part of other major centres, like SAFE as a major initiative. Um, most recently directed a centre of excellence, but also been the node leaders a node leader of um, uh, NERT programs as well. And a big area that I've, I've spent a lot of um, my own research time on has been focused on the island of Borneo. So quite a long way from um, the Antarctic space. But there was part of a, a team of researchers and led the science um, program for the Borneo Futures Research Initiative as well. Um, the other area where, aside from kind of large centres and large teams, um, that I spend a lot of my time currently is in external advisory roles. And some of these have interface um, with, uh, I guess, large programs like SAFE. Um, as natural science scientist um, leader for the UNESCO Australian National Commission and also on the Australian Heritage Council. Um, but also with um, providing scientific advice um, through committees such as the um, Great Barrier Reef Independent Expert Panel. And I think some of the, the approaches and the lessons that we take from that sort of high level government engagement um, will also play out to, to have relevance and usefulness for, for SAFE also. And I want to keep that in mind um, as we develop the program. So I guess what characterised my research is um, interdisciplinarity and we have aspirations with SAFE for the program to be interdisciplinary also. And some of what we've been talking about in our various theme discussions so far have had a flavour of interdisciplinarity, um, but I think with the types of um, folk that we have involved in the program, we could really probably take quite a deep approach to, to that aspiration around interdisciplinarity. And I, I wanted to include this slide because uh, I guess, you know, as a previous member of the ARC College of Experts and you know, a regular reviewer for the ARC, you often see research that's tagged as interdisciplinary and, but there's, you know, different levels of, of what that looks like. And, and really that you know the, 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 the truth around interdisciplinary research is that it takes more time, more patience, and a more deliberate um, commitment to combining disciplines. And what I'm really excited about with SAFE is that we have you know seven years of funding, we have a long-term program. So in theory at least, we have that time to slowly build collaborations across teams and really knit together disciplines in ways that, you know, we don't have the opportunity to do with short-term grants and, you know, other programs like the Discovery Program from the ARC. So, you know, we can make a deliberate choice here to actually go quite deep with the, the type of um, 
integration that we can have across our themes and, and Sharon um, is already giving a lot of thought to that, which is really exciting. The other kind of component, I won't dwell on this because I think we've, we've covered it in few of our, in our discussions, we certainly covered it in detail um, in our interview um, with the ARC, but you know, that, that kind of question around, well, what, why would an organisation, institution like QUT be involved? And I, I guess I want to keep in mind, and we've seen presentations from Kate and Mike and, and, um, and also Peter um, and others, and you know, that kind of benefit and ad advantage that we have um, associated with that outsider kind of um, innovation. And, and just that, I guess, the, it, just to express the openness that we have at QUT and from the other organisations that are kind of new to the Antarctic space, um, for people to really capitalise on that. So in the, um, you might recall from the original proposal um, that we kind of framed the safe um, way of thinking around the social ecological systems framework, um, a framework developed by the Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom. And it's a, a framework that um, I've deployed in the, the Borneo um, research context, um, so in a very different setting. And I'm really excited to see how we um, apply this within SAFE. And I wanted to include this slide in my presentation just because I was framing, um, intending to frame and remind people uh, about that kind of the different levels of interdisciplinarity and how we could use this framework to um, bring together the, the physical, um, natural and social sciences and, and political aspects too, um, to develop problems to, and questions to explore within our within our program as we're thinking about that within our themes. So, um, aside from uh, I guess being uh, a jack of all trades and master of none, the the type of research that I do would be broadly framed as. Um, in the context of environmental decision making and those you know centers that I referred to before um, that was that the broader theme associated with um, with those and if I was to summarize my um, I guess my research career on a single slide this would be the premise for the problems that um, I've explored in the and in, in, in the different contexts in which I've worked so you know it kind of boils down to there being multiple things that we can do in any location um, in the world at any given time um, in order to, you know, broadly speaking, protect or restore nature. Um, but we are often working with limited resources, be it money, um, people, time. And therefore, that requires us to be really clear about what we're trying to achieve. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, and it also requires us to acknowledge that environmental decision making in this context is um, challenged by the fact that there's time delays and that there are multiple stakeholders with different values um, at play as well. So this is the, I guess, my research um, in a, a single slide. To go in a little bit more detail within that, um, there's a variety of tools, decision support tools and disciplines and theories that we draw upon uh, in order to, to answer environmental decision-making questions. Um, and Mike and Kate and Matthew, um, in their presentation much earlier on uh, in this series, um, went into a, um, detail around some of these. But the one I'll probably use, that I'm going to use today to, to frame up some of the, the, the uh, approaches and questions that we've explored is um, structured decision-making which also um, we referred to in our original safe um, proposal as well. So um, structured decision making um, in its simplest form could be, and it is actually quite simple, um, described as a, um, a series of steps um, from problem definition through to, to taking action. And we, 
in some problems work across all of these steps, but for the most part, um, in my research and that of my students, we take um, a really close look at one aspect of this kind of flow chart, if you'd like. The one that I'm only going to touch on a couple of um, examples today, and the first one will be around um, this kind of institutional context. So, you know, the, the mandate, the laws, the policies um, that inform the problem and the, the objective. That will be, that's the first one. So I'll just go into that now. Um, and I'm, I'm just using it, an example here that's really simple. So it's two threatened species. Um, and an assessment of the institutional context that determines the management of those um, two threatened species. And the, the way we developed this particular assessment um, was to construct a social ecological system, much like the Ostrom framework that we referred to before, um, and, and then scoped the institutional framework that impacts the management of those two species in order to analyze the institutional fit. Um, and we use qualitative and quantitative measures to do that. The reason why I'm, I'm mentioning this is that kind of the, the, the notion of um, deconstructing both the ecological and social components of an environmental problem, and then understanding how your, your Man, your mandates, your statutes and legislation fit to that context. And this is, you know, this sort of process, I think, will have quite a lot of relevance to SAFE in, in our early kind of understanding of problem definition, when we're looking at problems within theme three um, that we, we seek to explore as part of SAFE. So the, in this particular case with the two threatened species, the eastern bristlebird and the northern, um, the, the nail-tail wallaby, we developed a, um, a dipsar model for those threatened species, so drivers, pressures, states, impacts and responses, and then uh, sought to, to identify the fit or lack thereof in that institutional context. And so this is you know, just for these two threatened species, it required us to review and analyze um, 260 documents uh, and um, pieces of legislation. And in order to do that effectively, we had to um, both adapt and develop approaches to mine those documents efficiently. And then what this allowed us to do is identify, well, where are, where are the gaps within that institutional framework that can be filled in order to reduce the pressures on these species and deliver better um, responses from their recovery efforts. So going back now to, to this um, flow chart, I'm going to now jump into the second box there, which is around objectives. And uh, in my experience, both working within academia, but also working outside of academia, the objective setting phase of any sort of environmental management planning, strategy development process is often really lightly done. Uh, and that's, um, that's a problem because those objectives determine what we seek to achieve and how what we will monitor and how we will evaluate ourselves. And so, you know, just this picture here is of, of uh, working with a, um, a linkage partner um, on an objective setting process for a project that we, we had funded together. And the project was to, to do all of the structured decision making steps within the three year project. And we ended up getting stuck on the objective setting step deliberately um, for about a year and a half. Because we realized that if we, and we initially set out to, to do it one way, but we realized the superficial treatment of the objectives um, was really going to steer this particular land management agency down the wrong path. And so we, with their um, enthusiasm, 
we use the research pro program to trial a range of different ways to elicit those objectives um, in order to ensure you know we well, we, we were making those underlying values explicit that they, they weren't going to have um, hidden values that would pop up in their management of their stakeholders and their relationships later on that could cause conflict, that we were assessing the, the alternatives, their management alternatives um, transparently, um, and that they were clear around their trade-offs, around the things that they were choosing to take on as a land management agency uh, and the things that they were not going to do, um, which is, you know, kind of a really clear um, and definitive uh, thing for agencies to be um, transparent about. So, um, as I said, you know, for over the course of this project, we trialled a, a range of things. And one of the really simple tools that we um, sh was shown to be really effective for a range of different um, communities that had influence on their um, their objectives was the simple process of asking why something was important five times. So, you know, you can get quite fancy elicitation um, approaches and, but just, you know, repeating that question of, and why does that matter, um, can really lead to those fundamental objectives. And, you know, whilst this kind of seems like a superficial example, probably one of the more satisfying research projects applied research projects that I've been involved in because I know that it's um, a really developed a really strong platform for all of their future endeavours um, in this space. So I, I'm not going to go through all of these steps as I said I just don't you know don't have time to populate it with examples but um, for the most part um, my research group focuses on this assessment of consequences, trade-offs and, and um, and through collaboration with the likes of Mike and Kate and others, the optimization component. And there's um, just a couple of projects, both from Borneo, just to keep it simple, that I wanted to mention here that I think we could um, lend some, some knowledge to in the Antarctic context as well. And the first is a project from several years ago now, but it, um, the main lessons were around uh, the development and the construction of species relevant targets and ensuring that we're accounting for the, the true contribution of different management actions in our conservation planning approaches. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to further conversations with Justine and Alex and others um, to build upon their work in systematic conservation planning to start to um, I guess, revisit some of these earlier ideas that have been applied in um, terrestrial settings um, and, and, and see their um, relevance, I guess, explore their relevance in the Antarctic conservation planning space as well. And the other example um, is a more of a scenario-based approach to exploring protected area systems. Um, and from the island of Borneo, what I guess, you know, the similarity to Antarctica is you have multiple, I guess, stakeholder countries um, seeking to achieve goals uh, independently. Um, and then this scenario-based um, planning approach, we explored the, uh, the efficiency gains and the, um, the target gains that could be achieved through collaboration. Um, and and I think that this, you know, this, when I read the Antarctic Science Plan and I listen to, um, you know, the experiences of the likes of Stephen and Alex in, the, in those discussions, I think this sort of scenario approach, and um, systematic conservation planning approach could be really useful to explore. Um, I've only got a couple more minutes remaining um, and I have, spoken about this both within the program executive group um, already and, and some of our other startup meetings. So I'm not going to go into detail um, around this, but in my role within SAFE, in addition to really enjoying and getting to understand the science and the, and the research questions and being involved in that, I'm also taking carriage of the um, career development and the gender equality um, components of the program. And you know our program, you know it's in startup phase. You know we don't have 
um, money flowing to our organisations yet, but I have committed time, um, my own and that of my team at QUT, to get these plans developed um, from the outset. Because in my experience with those other centres, if we don't get um, this sort of thinking up front, we, you end up playing catch up. You, you're catching up because you're, you've allocated funding um, in a way that doesn't allow you to achieve your career development ambitions for your program, or you've um, initiated recruitment processes and, um, and then you may not be uh, achieving um, your goals around um, diversity and equality. So we got, um, we've got onto this um, early and I'm hoping that it can help shape the, the values, the culture and the, the tone of our collaborations um, throughout the life of SAFE. Um, they, they've been, these two plans have now been um, just put together in draft form um, and the program executive group has um, been um, kindly providing some feedback um, and when um, if within the next month or so I'm going to send it out more broadly for others um, to provide and contribute to as well but please um, if this is an area of passion for you career development equality and diversity then um, I'd love to, to have your um, input early on so I'm going to run out of time very shortly um, and I want to jump back to Sharon. So what I might do um, is just, I guess, just mention there, we've developed this as um, with key components to this plan and the um, diversity and inclusion plan, similarly uh, with um, kind of uh, overarching goals and a series of programs and activities that we will um, place underneath those plans um, in order to, to deliver on them. So anyway, that's enough from me. And um, Sharon, you're there now, so you'll be able to, to help take questions as well. Thank you.